desire or lack thereof to shop him and get rid of him and a lot more to do with I don't know who's trading for him. I, I just don't know who's trying to pick up a $10 million contract for a guy, especially if Welcome into the Hot Read Podcast for Friday, March the 10th. I'm your host, Easton Freeze, Director of Published Content here at BroadwaySportsMedia.com. We are also brought to you by the 440 Podcast Network. It is a beautiful Friday morning, and we are back after a little bit of an unexpected hiatus. I mean, really, it was just four days, okay? It's, for us, a long hiatus, but for any other show you listen to that probably does one show a week, really not even longer than that. So get over it. We're back. Uh, we needed a minute to relax. And by we, I, of course, mean... My partner in crime, producer JT. JT, how are you? Have you recovered this week after our week-long jaunt in Indianapolis? I have, and as of recording this right now, I can't wait to get right back into this. And uh, right as I've recovered, right, um, Mm -hmm. I'm being thrown back into the fires of Restaurant Dart League tonight. So I'm expecting myself to be out till 2.30 or so tonight. So So it's the exact same lifestyle that we got we got accustomed to in Indianapolis last week. So you should be ready to roll with that. Um, We, we ended up taking Wednesday off. There was plenty to talk about. We just, for, for different reasons, needed a a little break. Hopefully you can forgive us after we gave you six neat, dare I say, fantastic episodes live from Indianapolis last week. We're going to talk here at the beginning of the show today, a little bit about our thoughts, maybe just five or 10 minutes from the combine, just some overarching ideas that we came away with, some guys that we were overall most impressed by. And then today to really kick off, um, and I, we've been saying it for two, three, maybe even four weeks now, JT, this weird lull between, okay, championship weekend is come and gone. We now have the senior bowl and the pro bowl games and then the super bowl, which is awesome but kind of weird and outside of the regular NFL season week to week grind. Right. And then we've got this lull of not really into free agency yet. Definitely too early to be diving into prospects for the draft. Then we hit the combine, which was fantastic and a whirlwind. And we, we had a fun, a a fun, a ton. That's how much fun we had is we forgot how to speak English, a ton of fun in Indianapolis. And now I feel like we are in the window JT As soon as the combine ends, one could argue as soon as the combine begins all the way through combine week and then the six, seven, eight weeks between the end of the combine and the beginning of the draft, we are in the meat of the offseason. And this year, I guess it's maybe not the case for every team, but at the very least for the Titans and folks that cover the Titans and pay attention to the Titans for the AFC South. And I would argue for the NFL as a whole, because this offseason has a ton of questions across the board. This offseason is really only an offseason in name. We can call it, I don't know, not the regular season, the 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 spring and summer season, because off is not an, an apt word to describe the whirlwind of information, news, drama, signings, cap casualties, draft picks, uh, all of these things that are going to slam into our face at 90 miles an hour in the next nine weeks or so is going to be just as exciting, at least to me. Maybe I'm just a sicko for the NFL, but I there are things about the offseason, JT, and I'm, w- I'm wondering if you agree that I find just as fascinating and fun as the regular season. I, I think it's once the combine hits, that's when it gets super fascinating to me because you yep. learn a lot about all these other, other guys who are going to be coming to the NFL, and it's just like from there on to the draft, it just I get really excited for it. Yeah, and I, for us, having been there at the combine, meeting these prospects, talking to the prospects, uh, hobnobbing in the evenings with a, a bunch of people that we were super jacked to get to meet and uh, form connections with, but but really getting to watch the athletic testing and the combine, if nothing else, JT, I came away thinking this is the quintessential primer for the the draft every single year. If you spend a week here at the combine and pay any amount of attention at all, you are perfectly equipped to dive right into this class because you get a kind of a a it's kind of a a flight um you know a a sample like an appetizer sampler platter you get just a little bit of a taste of every position group you get the overview the ten thousand foot view of things you don't really have the opportunity during the week to dive deep into anybody because there's 
350 prospects there. You got a ton of people you want to meet, a ton of people you want to write about or talk about on your show. Like it, it's impossible to really zero in on one person, but it is the perfect opportunity to get a baseline for everybody. And um, we can use this as the perfect transition into our warm up today. So let's get into the hot read warm up for today, which is our combine standout draft. JT, you and I are going to go back and forth and each select five guys um, that were the most impactful in our eyes during the week at the Combine, the guys who had the best week, maybe the guys that we didn't know about going into the week, but after coming back home, we are really impressed by them, and they they made an impression with us in Indianapolis. I'll let you go first, since I've done most of the talking so far today. Who's the first guy or guys that stood out to you at the Combine and why? Yeah, the first, this is kind of a two for one for my first first one. Which I'd be mad at you for, but my first one's also a two for one (laughs) so I can match you. I saw saw you cheated and said, I'll cheat with him to make it fair. Um, It's got to be the guys out of Iowa, specifically Lucas Van Ness and Jack uh, Campbell. That's crazy. I didn't hear you mention Jack Campbell's name once last week. I know, right? It's crazy. crazy. And the funniest thing is, I knew who you were attracted to all week long. Yeah, I I knew I knew of Lucas Van Ness did not know a lot about Jack Campbell. And those are the two, uh, at least interview wise, that just absolutely blew me away this weekend from their from their just the knowledge that they have of the game to what their work ethic would be and is in the college realm, as well as what, what it would look like in an NFL pro uh, sense. I I just really thought they really stood out. I I think Lucas Van Ness for sure is a first rounder. I think he's going to be one of the top three edge guys there who come off the board very quickly. And then Jack mm-hmm. Campbell, if I could, if I could bet money on Jack Campbell going in the second, I would, because he is quickly becoming if one of, if not the best linebacker prospects in this draft. I was about to say, you said interview wise, but for at least Jack Campbell's sake, I mean, it was everything. He ended up walking away with a 9.98 RAS, which I know we talked about during the week, but this dude tested off the charts as well as was really impressive uh, in, in his interview availability. So I think those are two great answers. My first one, I, I double dipped as well to match JT and I'm going with the, the fellas from the Terps secondary, the cornerbacks out of Maryland, Deontay Banks and Jacory and Bennett. Both of them really impressed me in their media availability in particular, Deontay Banks, who I got to ask a couple of questions of thought that he had a really good head on his shoulders, answered the questions. Well, was uh, a good communicator, seems to be level-headed. And then in his testing, I need to pull up both of those guys' testing numbers. But I know that on the day that we had the DBs do their athletic testing on the field at Lucas Oil Stadium, both guys kind of led the cornerback class in their 40 times. I think they were both sub-4-5. I'm pulling up Deontay Banks. They were because um, Deontay so, Banks yep, they, er, early in the first. Um, I said four five. I meant four four. Yeah, and they were both four four sub four four. Banks ran a four three six unofficial. His RAS nine point nine nine so far. I haven't gotten all the numbers to plug in there yet. By the way, RAS if you're unfamiliar, relative athletic score put together by at Math Bomb Kent Lee Platt is his name. Um, kind of a third party guy, but does work that is highly revered by everybody in the draft community. So definitely check out his relative athletic score. When we say RAS, that's what we're referring to. Uh, it's out of 10. So to have a 999 unofficial RAS is not bad, not bad at all. Um, and then I believe Bennett actually had a better 40 time. He did. He had the best 40 time of the day. I want to say it was a 3-1. I'm putting together some awesome audio here for you guys as I'm looking things up. <clears throat> Here we go. Yeah, Jacorian Bennett uh, with a 984 RES. He's not nearly the prospect that Banks is. Banks is a guy that I think may very well end up slipping into the first round, even though he's been a early to mid day two prospect so far. I think that his stock's going to continue to rise. Really love him. And if if a team like the Titans could get him at, you know, the beginning of day two in the second round would be an absolute steal. I think he's an immediate starter in the league. Got the size and the speed. And he he's coming from a program that you know, I played him in a way that was versatile enough. I think you would be pretty comfortable playing him anywhere on the field in the secondary for Bennett. He's going to be a guy that's probably more late day two into day three, nine, eight, four unofficial RAS, but ran a four, three flat 40 yard dash, 
was blazing out there. Not nearly the size that a guy like Banks offers, and that's what makes him not quite the prospect that um, Deontay Banks is. But both of those guys I could see. I mean, with with Bennett, you may end up finding yourself a, a guy that could be, despite being a little bit smaller, a a counterpunch to teams that have that true burner on the outside. He can keep up with them. So I loved both of those guys, thought that they tested really well. And um, I, I think, you know, the, the Terps out there in Maryland doing a good job putting together their defensive back group. Who is the second person that stood out to you at the Combine, JT? Uh, the second player that I had that stood out at the Combine here has to be Kalijah Kansi. I think mm-hmm. there is nobody else in this draft class who r- rose their stock more in, in this in this past week than Kalijah Kansi. You mean Probably... miniature Aaron Donald, the next coming of Aaron Donald? Yeah, as I've been exactly. Informed. Yeah, right. It's it's almost fitting that they are both alumni of the same place, which is Pitt University. Um, very similar builds. Kali- very similar builds. Kalijah Kansi was looking to be more of a late day two guy, but now is most likely going to go in the mid to late first round, if not fall into the early second round. Uh, Kalash, I can't see. Surprised if he's I'd be very surprised day, as think? well. Yeah. I, I think there's a team who would, who would like his build and his size and what he can bring to a team. And will definitely look for him as an option compared to some of the other guys who were touted as these top five uh, defensive interior guys. The, the big thing, though, was that Cansey ran a 4.67 40-yard dash, which was the fastest time of any defensive tackle since 2000, which he's got the speed, he's got the size, he looked yeah, very he similar to Aaron Donald. I, I think he's another guy who wasn't on my radar at first, but is now a top or first-round pick. No, that's a great one, and that was an easy one that everybody kind of latched onto. I know we weren't even – he wasn't on our radar really until we went in for the athletic testing on that first day and we saw him go and we're like, Whoa, who is this guy? I, I, I mean, maybe you had, I would not even, I'm not sure if I, I'd even uh, looked into him at all until that day, but we went home and definitely did some digging on him. My second guy. And this is a, I went with some more, maybe some more Titans Homer picks here. Um, as I'm looking at my list, I didn't intend for that to be the case. Maybe I'm just naturally drawn to the guys I'm more apt to be covering in the next coming months, but this one. And I think, even if I, you know, was covering a team that wasn't in the market for a tackle early in the draft, I still think I would have come away with this this takeaway from his athletic testing session. Paris Johnson Jr., man, we, we talked about it the day of on our live show. And I'm going to talk about it again now. We were so impressed by his movement skills as compared to the rest of the tackles that he was out there testing with. He just moved so much better than the rest of the guys. And for a guy at his size, his testing numbers were fantastic. Um, I believe ran right around a 540 time. Um, and he has a, a, an RAS in the high nine and a half range as well. Couldn't couldn't find his on on first glance. I'm not going to make you sit and think about it. Uh, think, listen to me while I think about it and find it again. But he he just his he was the most impressive guy I thought tackle wise um, that morning at the the media availability. Really fantastic ability to answer questions. Um, did, did a good job, uh, in his testing, of course. And then the on-field drills are really where he stood out to me. Just the eye test with this guy compared to the rest of the class. He moves so well. He seems to be really polished in his movement technique and a lot of the game in game specific drills. I mean, they're not really, they're not replicating real football in any, any real way, shape or form, but the drills section of the testing is meant to better replicate something that those guys might actually be doing on the field. And some of the things like, you know, pulling in and trying to block at the second level, getting to the third level, um, being able to, to navigate with an, another guy pulling next to you and, and the aggressiveness that he was hitting the bags and then going right from um, just raw, pure strength, hitting the bags harder than anybody else to, really beautifully shuffling his feet and gliding across the field as compared to some of the other guys that were just kind of stomping their way across the, uh, across the field there at Lucas Oil stadium. It stood out in a big way. So he was a big winner in my book. Uh, The third guy here on my list is Josh Downs, the wide receiver out of UNC. He was one of those guys who was on my radar. Just like you said, if there's a guy I want to be covering 
when the draft comes along and the Titans could look to take him, I think Josh Downs is one of those guys who is currently as, as at post combine, his draft stock is right around that 40 to 45 range when it comes to picks. So right around the Titans second round pick, Josh Downs was a guy who I thought he wasn't the fastest, but out of the smaller, faster guys, he had the, he was the most fluid, the most explosive, and the most well put together receiver I saw out of there. There was a, cu- a couple guys who I thought maybe ran a couple drills better than he did. Some of those guys in the top five, but if you're looking for a wide receiver in the second round, I, I think if you go back and look at his gauntlet tape from the combine, I think that's all you need to see to sell you on why he is at least in the second round the best wide receiver. Yeah, no, he's he was a riser that I I was uh he caught my eye as well for sure. My third guy, again, everyone's been talking about him, but it's true. It's CJ Stroud. We expected on our combine preview show um before we went last week, we expected him to look awesome against air and to be awesome in that that closed course situation they have there at the at the Lucas Oil Stadium, and especially when he was only going up against Richardson and Levis and um, not having to compete with Bryce Young. So it it was something that we expected for him to do. He did it. He passed with flying colors, did a fantastic job. Um, I'm going to pull up his numbers real quick, but he put together a really impressive, uh, a really impressive set of drills. Um, Even, even though I would say the quarterback session was the, the show was stolen by Richardson it in hindsight has kind of been a split deal. I think from a narrative standpoint, folks have been really impressed with both of those guys. Stroud's being talked about as a guy that you could see go first overall. Richardson's a guy you're seeing talked about, like he could go first overall. I think both of those things are a little bit overblown and the market might correct itself a little bit as we get closer to draft time. It may swing back in the direction of Bryce young, especially after we see him uh, after he's definitely not lost 10 or 15 pounds by his pro day so that he can throw and run and be really athletic. But, he was super impressive. I see why folks are intrigued by him as a guy that you could sell the farm to go up and get. We're going to talk a little bit later in the show today about the Titans interest in him or another quarterback and whether that's a good idea, whether or not we think they may be leaning in that direction um, in the next segment, but he was super impressive. My fourth guy here. And this was a guy I, when I, when I was looking at the standouts from this draft. I think we talked so much about cornerbacks, but from this, if there's a guy that you should watch going into the draft that the Titans may look for in the third or fourth round, it's Darius Rush, the other cornerback out of South Carolina. I thought he, at least in his media availability, was a lot more impressive than Cam Smith, but I think he's just overall maybe a less talented cornerback than Cam Smith. Cam Smith, who for better or worse, kind of made his draft stock stay the same this past week. Darius Rush is that guy that you can find in the third or fourth round that I think the Titans would really like to have. I think he was my first guy last week that I was putting on my was putting on my alarm hat, my my little hat with an alarm on it saying woo 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 tighten the work tighten alert. I think he's an all around team guy and someone who I could see play for the Titans next year. Yep. No, I agree. Uh, My next guy is a guy that was supposed to be catching more passes from CJ Stroud that he ended up doing in his last year, but played with Stroud. Nonetheless, it's Jackson Smith in Jigba JSN very quickly has become the quarterback one uh, in the eyes of many covering this draft. He has been for me for a little bit with a bullet. I think that he is a member of the didn't play a ton or at all in my final year. So people forgot just how dominant I am club Um, that that is also occupied by some guys we've seen be real studs in the past in the NFL in recent memory, um, some guys that may or may not play for the Bengals and put, didn't play their last year at LSU come to mind. Um, but with, with JSN, we didn't get to see him run the 40. He'll do that at his pro day. I'm guessing still maybe some injury concerns lingering for him. I'm not sure exactly the reason why he didn't run one, but nonetheless, we'll get one. Eventually he's expected to run very well. His RAS so far and 9.39. Very good. He's got okay size. But his ability to just move buttery smooth on the field. Again, this is more an eye test to take than anything. But watching him amongst the other receivers in the receiving drills out there on the field just looked different. Looked like a guy that was much more polished, much more NFL ready than many of the others. And I think that he, you know, barring any injury concerns lingering still, which I don't think that they really are. I think that he just wanted to run at his own pro day. 
I think that he's going to be the wide receiver one out of this class. Even if he's not drafted one overall, I think that he'll prove to be the best, at least in his first year out of anybody in this class. So I really, really was impressed with JSN. Who was your last guy? My final guy here, I was looking at the day two tackles and I was like, who really stood out to me and rose their stock the most? And that's Blake Freeland out of BYU. Mm -hmm. Blake Freeland had an absolutely crazy combine setting the O-line record for vertical jump with a 37, which is better than a lot of uh, receivers you've heard of, maybe AJ AJ Brown, Brown. Michael Pittman, DeAndre Hopkins, the list goes on and on. This dude has crazy vertical and he ran a really good 40 time as well, which just kind of made you look at him and say, this guy may have not had the best tape, but the traits are there. The physical traits are there. And I think he's a guy that a lot of teams will look at in the second round, maybe including the Titans if they don't go um, at offensive tackle at the 11th overall pick that they could swoop up in the second round. Yeah, I put out a mock draft. I think it was yesterday saying if the Titans decide to go up and get their quarterback, here's what Rand Carthen and Mike Vrabel can do to save the Titans uh, 2023 season and still be competitive. And I drafted Freeland actually in the third round in my PFF mock draft that I put out. Had a lot of people saying, oh, what? So this in this scenario, they go they go get two tackles in free agency. I said, no, man, put some respect on break some <laughs> respect on Blake Freeland's name, dude. Dude's the truth. Dude is the future. I think that he could absolutely be a day two, maybe even a late day two starting productive tackle for a team in short order. Built kind of funny, strange build for a tackle, a little bit more top heavy than you tend to see. But the testing is all there. The movement was there. I was impressed with him as well. Love that one. My last one is a guy that everybody in Titans land was ranting and raving about after his athletic testing. And for good reason, Starnell Washington, big fella, tight end out of Georgia. And he is a guy that, you know, his draw, it draft, his, his draft positioning still kind of up in the air so far. I don't know if he'll end up being available at, at the, the turn in on day two, at the beginning of day two in the second round. RAS of 985. I'm pulling up the link here for the full graphic, but he was off the charts with his 40. Ran a 464, which doesn't sound all that great until you realize he's six six and a half and 264 pounds. Did 21 benches, 10 yard split of 161, which is very good. Uh, a uh, over 10 foot broad jump. This dude is a is a freak athlete. There was a very very viral video of him during the receiving portion of their testing where he makes a really fantastic um, mo- adjustment in space with his, again, 264 pound body, all, all six foot, almost seven of him, adjusts to the ball in the air, catches it with one hand, keeps his feet in bounds. And yet at that size, he could be a menacing threat for you as an, as an additional tackle on the field, essentially. I mean, he is the Rob Gronkowski body type. Now, is he going to have a hall of fame career like Gronk did not putting that on him? Not, you know, it's, it's a play style comp, not a um, success comp, but man, did he look like a guy that if he pans out could be one of those guys, that's just a cheat code for a team, you know, teams that have the Travis Kelsey's of the world, the Gronks of the world, when you've got that guy and you're not having to pay them wide receiver money, you're paying them tight end money, dude, he could be a guy if his receiving prowess um, and his his body allows him to be the the blocker that we think that he could be. He may he may very well be the biggest boom bust candidate in this draft because if he booms, the ceiling for him is ridiculous. All right, so those were our top five ish each guys that stood out to us in the draft. Gave you a couple of bonus ones there, not in the draft in the combine rather. And I'm kind of rushing today. Sorry if I'm speaking a little bit fast, but we are up against the the time wall here. And I've I've got seven questions today. We're going to do another installment of one of my favorite segments on the show, Fake Questions, Real Answers. It's topics that I would like to put out there onto the internet and have you all submit mailbag questions for me to answer. Um, But I just simply couldn't be bothered to do that today. And uh, I wanted to make sure the questions were good and were things that I wanted to talk about. Not to say that you guys don't give me good questions. You do. But that requires patience and then collecting the questions and typing them up and giving credit, blah, blah, blah. We'll do that with the draft. We'll probably do a couple of draft mailbags before it's all said and done this year. But for today, there were just too many good, juicy topics that I had to address. And this is a great format to get to talk about them. So I wrote the questions for you, sent them into myself. You're welcome. They're great questions, by the way. Thank you all for writing them. 
Um, and uh, they are questions that I'm going to answer. There are seven of them. They're kind of all over the board. Some of them Titans related, some of them league related. We'll catch up on some of the news of the week here as well. Get it all packed into this final segment of fake questions, real answers. And producer JT, if you would not mind pitching me these questions that are, again, our listeners definitely wrote and sent in to us. Could you read me this first question? Yeah, let's get into it here. And Adam Schefter reported on Thursday evening that the Titans plan on releasing Bud Dupree at the beginning of the new league year on March 15th. It's going to save them $9.35 million against the cap in 2023, but they could have saved even more if they made him a post-June 1st cut. What does the move tell us about the Titans, and do you agree with the decision? So I do agree with the decision. We were talking about this a couple of times on shows last week and the week previous we knew last week it was reported while we were still in Indianapolis that the Titans were planning on cutting Bud Dupree. There wasn't much else reported besides that. We were assuming at the time that that meant he was going to be cut as soon as the new league year began, similar to the way that the Rams announced they were going to be releasing Bobby Wagner almost two weeks ago, I think. He still is technically on the team because you can't make these cuts for certain guys that have contract guarantees for this upcoming season, you can't make cuts for them until the beginning of the new league year, which the 2022 league year ends and the 23 year begins on March 15th, I think at like 3 PM central time, something like that. That's something that they needed to wait to do, but they could still announce it early. We were wondering why they hadn't. It sounded like based on a report from our buddy, Teron Davenport report, he was talking about it on a, a radio hit with Jared Stillman here in town. Last week, I think on Tuesday of the Combine week, he was mentioning how it sounded like there was a chance Bud Dupree, a guy who everyone was assuming would be a cap casualty, may actually come back. That was something that, it, if we're inferring, was something that was discussed during last week. Both sides decided that, or at least the Titans side decided that it wasn't going to be something they would pursue. So they decided to announce they were going to be cutting him. Again, we were assuming that meant a March 15th cut. We now know for sure, based on Schefter's report, that it will be a March 15th cut and not a post-June 1st cut. The difference there, by the way, if you're not sure what that means, is that in cutting him now and not waiting until June 1st, the Titans, again, save $9.35 million. They now have that immediately in the bank. He's got a dead cap hit of something in the 12 region, I think. It's low double digits. What they could have chosen to do was wait until June 1st, make him designate him as a post-June 1st cut, which is just a way for GMs and front offices to spread out dead cap hit over a couple of seasons and not eat all of that dead cap in one season. It's a, it's a useful tool if you have a ton of cap space available to you now and or in the future. It's also a useful tool if you're looking to maximize your money returned, minimize the amount of dead cap on your books, um, it's something that you tend to do if you are either really cap rich or need as much cap space as possible because you're going all in or because you're, you know, going into the tank and deciding that you're going to try to save as much money as possible. You're tanking, you're resetting. And so you're just trying to get as much dead money off the books as possible to give you as much cushion in the next year or two to go and try to rebuild your team. All of that groundwork being put out there. And, and by the way, what's important about the June 1st thing is that if the Titans had chosen to cut him post June 1st, they would have gotten, I think, six or seven additional million dollars in cap space available to them. So instead of just sh short of 10 million available now in the spring, they would have in the summer had about 16 and a half, I believe, million dollars in cap space. And then Dupree's dead cap would have been split over this season and the next season. That's why, for example, Julio Jones is still on the books for the Titans this year. He was a post-June 1st cut last year, so he's on the books for dead cap the last two seasons. They made the right choice on the timing, and we were talking about this a little bit in previous episodes, but I'll reiterate, you make this move now if you believe as a team, like Amy Adams Strunk said on the day that they announced Rand Carthen as the new GM of the team, that they hired him in part because he believes Amy believes, the team believes, this Tennessee Titans team is not in a place where it needs to do a full rebuild, reset, tear down, um, uh, tank job this year. That's not what they're interested in. It's not the culture that Amy is trying to pursue with her team. It's certainly not the way that Mike Vrabel tends to operate. And it seems to be the way that, that uh, it seems to not be the way that Rand Carthen likes to operate either. 
because with this move, we have gotten the closest thing so far to a confirmation that the Titans are, in fact, not in a full reset mentality. Because otherwise, they would have waited and made him, or at least announced, I mean, you could have announced it at the beginning of the league year on March 15th. Hey, we're cutting Bud Dupree. He's going to be a post-June 1st cut, so we're not getting that money now. We'll get more later and split his dead cap over the next two years. They made the announcement now, which means that they are going to cut him on March 15th. They'll get that money now. Why do you need that money now and not in June when you can have more of it? Because there aren't any free agents to sign in June. Some people were saying, well, just spend all your money now and then use that extra six, six, seven million dollars to sign your draft class in June. The draft class doesn't cost that much money. And also the the 10, almost 10 million dollars in cap relief you get now to go and put towards another guy. I don't know, some offensive lineman, perhaps. That's what you need now in the spring when all the free agents are available. And I don't know if you've looked at this year's free agent class. But it's not great across the board, kind of the entire league, not in an awesome spot in terms of available free agents, which may be a blessing in disguise, frankly, because most often teams that go heavy into free agency are spending too much on mediocre guys. And there's a reason a lot of those free agents are free agents in the first place. And it tends to end up like, what was it, the 2020 New England Patriots, where they spent like $140 million and went and got two premium tight ends and Hunter Henry and a guy that used to play for the Titans, who you might notice now is being talked about as a potential cut candidate in new England. Um, but, but that's, that's something that is important for these teams, especially the Titans this year where they've only got two or three or four viable tackles, for example, on the market, the Titans definitely need to secure one, one would think. And so having money to be able to go and do that, you know, you can actually entertain the idea of an Orlando Brown, for example, out of Kansas City. He's probably going to set the market for tackles. He's going to be in the 20 to 25 million dollars APY range. You couldn't really entertain that if you weren't releasing a guy like Bud Dupree and getting that 10 some odd million dollars back. So right choice releasing him, right choice on the timing. If you're truly rebuilding this year, you might as well wait until June. They're not rebuilding. They're getting the money now. And so teams that are players and spenders in free agency, they're at least trying to contend. That's the signal we got from the Titans, and that's why they released him now instead of in the summer. Our second question here, today it was announced that the Texans got in a little bit of trouble for something that happened in 2020. (laughs) What happened, and does it even really matter? So what happened is, and this is the text, I believe that Ian Rappaport, um, or it may have been Pelissero, one of the two, over at NFL Network, got, uh, and then just tweet. I, I always love when these highfalutin agents uh, or, you know, news-breaking guys tweet out just the the raw text they got from some agent, or, or in this case, I'm guessing um, New York, the NFL offices. This was the text that he got and reported on for the Titans' disciplinary actions. It says, in all caps, Houston Texans disciplined for salary cap reporting violation. The Houston Texans will forfeit their original fifth round pick in the 2023 NFL draft and have been fined $175,000 for a salary cap reporting violation the NFL announced today. This was today, by the way, Thursday, uh, March the 9th. The, the, uh, pursuant to the salary cap requirements in the collective bargaining agreement, clubs must report any player compensation or benefit Following a review, the NFL determined that the club deter- that the club provided then Texans quarterback Deshaun Watson with undisclosed compensation in the form of a membership at an alternative athletic facility in 2020. So this all centers around when the Texans were having Deshaun Watson hold in their training camp before the season that he did not play, before we ever knew that he was a uh, potentially a sexual predator of sorts, um, before all of that happened. And he was just holding in and they were trying to be cordial with him. It sounds like they were paying for a membership for him to go and do some outside athletic um, activities, I guess, training at a local gym or a local training facility of some sort that they didn't report. It sounds like the Texans are claiming it was just a an oversight, but they got slept on the hand for it anyways. Um, and really, I guess the report should say that the Texans have been fined billionaire pocket change $175,000 is a drop in the bucket for any of these NFL franchises and will be forfeiting one of their 10 million draft picks this year for a Watson era salary cap violation so not a big news thing but 
it is one less pick that the Texans have, one less pick that they have to package if they were wanting to move up and get a guy. And uh, a fifth-round pick, while not that consequential, it matters. There's a reason why the, the NFL is levying it as a punishment. So uh, a big deal for the Texans, I suppose, but not a massive news story. The NFL announced compensatory picks today for the 2023 NFL draft, and the Titans were not awarded any. Why is that, and what are your thoughts on the comp pick system? So I have some thoughts on this and an answer to the that question as to why the Titans weren't awarded any. But before I get into that answer, I need to remind you that if you are listening to our show via podcast, thanks so much. That's awesome. We appreciate you doing that. There's a even better version of the show you can in, you can consume with both your ears and your eyes. It's over on Broadway Sports Media's YouTube page. It's the video version of the show. It's great. We have awesome graphics. Our beautiful faces are there. You can put a name to a face or voice to the, a face rather and uh, see our, our guests, our graphics. We do an awesome job with the video. So go over, subscribe there as well as subscribing wherever you get your podcasts and uh, make sure that you watch our videos over on YouTube as well. We all also often cut up shows into segments that you can go and see individual segments of the show on YouTube if you were wanting to, to check out a specific thing or see a specific graphic. Now, as to the question with the compensatory picks, why didn't the Titans get any? Well, because they didn't lose anything. Now, a quick 10-second crash course on compensatory draft picks. These are picks that are awarded by the NFL to NFL franchises around this time of year before the draft each season. The, the letter of the law on compensatory picks, who gets one, who doesn't, is this. A team losing more or better compensatory free agents than it acquires in the previous year is eligible to receive compensatory draft picks per the league. The compensatory picks are positioned from round three to round seven based on the value of the compensatory free agents lost. The formula that determines compensatory free agents is based on salary, playing time, and postseason honors. So they have this propri proprietary formula up in Manhattan at the New York uh, offices for the NFL where they plug in who you got, who you lost, and find the net the net value if you are up net or down net in your personnel. And if you are down because you lost guys in free agency and didn't get guys to fill those spots, you're given additional picks, right? That makes sense. So for example, a couple of years ago when the Titans lost their uh, a star receiver and a star tight end to the Jets and the Patriots in free agency, they ended up getting, uh, I forget, I think it was a third round, maybe a fourth round draft pick for one of them and then a fifth or a sixth for the other. They got some compensatory picks in return because they didn't go get a big splash wide receiver in free agency, um, at least at the time of the comp picks being given out. And they, they didn't go get a big tight end to uh, re replace uh, Johnny Smith. So they lose Corey Davis. They lose Johnny Smith. They don't replace them with big free agent gets. So the NFL gives them a couple of picks to fill those spots. That's the idea. And what was added to this system in 2020 when the new CBA was put into place, this was part of a lot of the social justice activism that was going on um, at the time in the country. The NFL was getting in on that. The Players Association was obviously uh, the NFLPA was very involved in that as well. And so part of their bargaining for the 2020 CBA was that. Um, in addition to standard compensatory picks given to teams for guys that they lost picks to get players to replace players, they now also give out certain compensatory picks to teams at the end of the third round this year. In particular, they gave out five and they're awarded uh, in, in a given season for having a minority employee hired away by another club to be their head coach or a primary football executive. So, this year, we saw the Titans, of course, got none, didn't have any big free agents walk, haven't signed any big free, or aren't having uh, some big free agents uh, to sign, or excuse me, didn't sign any big free agents last season. So we weren't expecting them to get a ton of compensatory picks. But we do see the leader this year in comp picks, the 49ers. Man, they don't have any first or second round draft capital the next couple of years, but they have got some late day two and day three picks. They got seven seven compensatory picks for this year's draft it's borderline criminal it's crazy three of those seven came from losing a minority employee to go be a head coach or a again they word it so funny primary football executive i'm assuming that means more than just gm but where is the line drawn i guess the nfl decides the titans are 
for example, responsible for one of those three and hiring Rand Carthon away, a, a, a black man who is now the GM of the Titans team. He is hired away from San Francisco. So they get a, I think they got a third round pick at the end of the third round for him, for example. The, the standard system, and here's, here's my take on the comp pick system as constituted. The standard system for awarding picks is necessary and good, in my opinion, but the new system for minority hirings instituted in the 2020 CBA is, is way too rich a reward to be fair. Now, now, third round picks for having a coach or a GM hired away that happens to be a certain skin color just doesn't sit right with me, and I'm not trying to get into hot water or get too political. I, I understand the initiative. I understand what they're trying to do. I, it's, I think it's well-intentioned. It's, it's the right idea, but third round picks are just far too valuable in my opinion to be what is supposed to really be a small incentivizing reward for teams paying. Uh, really the idea is, Hey, we'll throw you some later round draft picks. If you pay good attention to minority candidates for your high, exe high ranking executive jobs, Let's we, we believe as as an NFL PA as a, and as an NFL company that some of these minority candidates aren't getting the look that they should, and so to incentivize the culture changing in that way, we're going to throw a bone to any team that decides to give these guys a, a, a look in hiring them, um, and then has them rise up their ranks. Because again, it's not the teams that that hire these guys as big executives that get rewarded. The Titans aren't getting rewarded for hiring a black man as their GM. They, I mean, they get applause from, I guess, the political media, but the team that gets the reward from the NFL is the team that hired him in the first place at a lower level. And granted, he was already a high level, almost decade in the league guy at the time of hiring with San Francisco. But Rand Carthen is hired by the, the 49ers at a lower position, rises up the ranks, gets to a position where he can be hired as a GM by another club. So they get rewarded. That just seems like, a recipe for disaster, frankly, and I think this is an example of of a quote unquote disaster in that area. With with the Niners getting three such uh, minority hiring comp picks, I believe all in the third round. It's just too often we see JT this brain drain uh, year or two from di different teams. You know, a team that gets really hot. You saw it with McVay. We're not seeing it with Shanahan, for example. A team like the Niners and Kyle Shanahan. They're the hot team offensively. They're the hot team personnel-wise. They're doing a great job. Awesome. The rest of the league takes notice. They're going to hire away a bunch of their executives. That's what happened, and it's what continues to happen, and is why the Niners keep getting all these comp picks for having minority candidates hired away. Now, props to them for hiring the minority candidates in the first place and having them on staff. Sounds like they're very good at their job because they're doing a good job over there, and they're getting hired to go play or perform elsewhere in the league. But it, it's again, it's a touchy subject, not eager to get entangled in it or piss anybody off. I'm not saying that it shouldn't be a thing that's that's considered by the league. There shouldn't be something trying to change the culture if we believe that there needs to be a cultural shift. But at the end of the day, when I'm looking at this at sport and trying to all I ultimately care about is can we make football as fair as possible? Things like the salary cap allow us to do that. Things like the draft allow us to do that. I take pride in covering primarily a sport. That is the 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 most diverse year to year in terms of who is good and who is bad. The turnover is is great, um, and that's what makes it so fun. Is because your team can suck and then you can win the Super Bowl ten seconds later or be in the Super Bowl like like JT's precious Bengals. You can be horrible your whole life and then you get one guy and suddenly you're off to the races and you're a contender year after year. So I, I get it. I understand the initiative. I just think that the rule is unbalanced and allows for well-intentioned social change initiatives to directly and dramatically impact the fairness of the sport itself. So I, th I don't think it should be done away with, but I think the dial needs to be adjusted just a little bit. A third round pick, a day two pick, that is really valuable, man. A third round pick is oftentimes a day one starter. I mean, it, it, you can get some really, really great guys in the third round. So I just don't think awarding uh third picks like they're like they're candy bars giving them out like they mean nothing like they're just lottery tickets yeah they're lottery tickets but they're the nice one they're not the one dollar scratchers man those are the 20 dollar powerball tickets that you think you actually have a chance with so I, I just think it needs a slight adjustment not trying to take anybody off but those are my two cents on that let's get to the next question the titans are rumored to be interested in moving up for a qb in this year's draft should they push their chips in to go get their guy will they actually try to go get their guy what are your thoughts yeah, so those are two questions that have been the focus point for all of Titans media since the season has ended. Will they do it? Should they do it? 
two questions that I'm not going to try to dive into the minutia of the actual debate right now on. We've already talked about it in the past. I've actually got some plans that I was talking to some folks today about JT. I haven't even told you about this, but I think we're going to do a series, either a multi-show series on this show, or maybe maybe we put it all in one show. I'm not sure what the format will be yet, but this Titans offseason is poised to be the most exciting offseason maybe of any team in the entire league, the most exciting for Titans fans in a long time because the Titans are in this very unique position in the NFL where it's a choose-your-own-adventure situation for them. They could go a million different ways. They really have a ton of options, and that means they have a ton of questions to answer. And as we all scramble to try to answer the 10,000 questions, I wanted to do a series talking to some people that I know who are are very well-read on these things, up-to-date on these things, have strong and compelling um, opinions and arguments on these things. I wanted to reach out to them and say, hey, come on the show. I want you to come with your one argument prepared and give us your be- lay out your best argument for why the Titans should go get a quarterback in the draft, why the Titans shouldn't and they should stick with Tannehill, why the Titans should cut Tannehill, not draft a guy and and go with the bridge quarterback and tear it all down, why they should go into full rebuild mode, why the Titans should focus on this position in free agency or this position in the draft or you know these big questions that we have. I want to address them all. And I want to address them all in a cool format where we get some differing opinions, some of the brightest minds in and around Titans media coming on the show, laying out for me and for you all their best argument for each of these things so that you can decide for yourself. So that's why I'm not going to dive into the topic today. But I do want to kind of canvas the debate because it is heated up this week, JT. I mean, we get back from the combine and the rumors are flying. The Titans, like you said, one of the teams that have become hot on the rumor mill in terms of potential trade up to that number one overall pick or maybe to number three with the Cardinals go up and get one of those quarterbacks they are on the radar of the entire league at this point whether it has any validity to it or not can't know for sure I'd imagine where there's smoke there's fire so they're at least considering it as they should here is here's my two cents this is a thought that I saw today I think it was Mike Herndon talking about it on Twitter but he was talking about the argument of well the titans have too many roster holes to go get a quarterback in the draft they can't they can't they can't bring a a rookie quarterback onto this team with with how many how how many positions are um flashing red lights on the dashboard of this team right now they're going to get killed they're they're not going to be able to succeed they're going to be like justin fields in chicago for his first two years something that i've argued quite a bit the, the the past couple of weeks he argues he thinks it's a poor argument He points out the Bengals, Bills, Jaguars, and Chargers all had a ton of holes when they drafted their franchise quarterbacks in the last couple of years. None of them regret doing that, obviously. If you have a chance to go get a guy you believe is a franchise QB, you do it immediately. That's the argument that Herndon's making. That's the argument that many are making, and I think it's a valid, coherent argument that that I'm willing to hear. My devil's advocate counterpoint, counterpoint, and I tweeted this at him at the time, and I want to talk about it a little bit now, All four of the teams that he listed, the Bengals, the Bills, the Jaguars, and the Chargers, they all had more capital to improve their team in the very offseason in which they drafted their franchise QB. And it did not cost any of those teams significant capital to go and get their guy in the same way that it would cost the Titans. I looked, all these teams had more draft, as many or more draft picks as the Titans have this year. Some of them had seven, eight, nine picks that season. Uh, a couple of them, like the Jaguars, had two first-round picks they could spend, one on a quarterback and one on Travis Etienne, for example. The Titans have six picks this year. They're s- currently scrounging for as much cap space as they can get. I think they're up into the 30s now. There's not a whole lot of room elsewhere for a bunch of money. Capital-wise, this offseason, it is slim pickings for the Titans. They're right around average in the league, maybe a little bit below average, and they have well above average roster holes and depth issues to fill. That's why I'm very hesitant to say, well, it's the same situation. Just go and get your guy. That's why I say there's a pretty decent chance that they were to go and get their guy and not be careful and and have to, for example, like it's being rumored, send this year's third round pick, swap firsts this year, and then send the first from the next three years or the next two years or whatever whatever it may be. That is a lot of capital that, that they may or may not regret spending on one quarterback that you're not even sure is going to pan out at best case there's a chance the best case scenario there is like Justin Fields he looks electric for two years on a team where nothing else goes right and they're horrible 
And suddenly you're two years into a rookie contract to deal with a guy that seems to be a hit, but, but you're still a bad football team. So we're going to dive into that conversation a lot more. I think there's coherent arguments on both sides, but I find it fascinating. And uh, this is really just an, exa- an opportunity for me to say, hey, keep an eye on this debate next week. We're going we're gonna to dive into it in a little bit more depth. JT, let's get to the next question. Vikings wide receiver Adam Thielen appears to be on the market this offseason. Is he somebody the Titans should have any interest in in free agency this offseason? Great question, Ryder. I don't know who this is, but they did a good job coming up with this one. And I will say briefly on this one, I'll be quick. Yes, I think the Titans should be interested in Thielen, but it all comes down to the money. Okay, this is not a guy that you overspend on because you're dying to have him in the room. If the number you like is a number he'll take, great. If not, you walk away. His stats, he's taken a little bit of a dive in recent years. I've got him pulled up here. Um, He doesn't have what he used to have. There's no doubt about that. He is about to be 33 years old this next year. Um, He played in all 17 games last year, although he was in and out with injuries getting banged up. It seemed like every other game. He ended up with 107 targets, 70 receptions. 700 yards um he he's had 700 or more yards the past three seasons so on paper his stats haven't gone down precipitously he he had six touchdowns this past season as opposed to 14 and 10 the previous two so you know his his catch percentage down uh, four or five percentage points to 65 percent overall though he's still got some juice to him and it, it seems to me that he would be as valuable if not more valuable as a veteran presence in the locker room, in that wide receiver room for the Titans, than he would be on the field as a wide receiver for the Titans. Right now, JT, do you know who the most tenured member of the Titans wide receiver core is? Is it like, that's such a hard one, like NWI or someone like that? It it is, is, currently it's Racy McMath, currently. (laughs) Now it could become NWI, but Racy McMath is currently your longest tenured guy in the locker room. No, you, you can't you can't have him be that guy you need a veteran presence in your wide receiver room so having feeling on your team on a reasonable contract making him your third or fourth option would be really ideal I think that he still has enough left in the tank to impact the game uh, impact multiple games in a season in my opinion we saw it last year in Minnesota he was an impact in a handful of games um, and and was a was a factor for them he just can't sustain the level of play that he used to. So I think that he should be one they have interest in, but maybe not for the typical production reasons you expect. We got conflicting reports this week that Derrick Henry and the Titans, he might be being shopped. He might not. Mm-hmm. We don't really know. Can you make any sense of this? Why, yes, I can try to do that. Um First of all, I think that there's some semantics play going on here. This is something that I saw both Mike Herndon and Paul Kaharski talk about on Twitter earlier this week. Completely agree. The first report we got was from Mike Silver, who we ran into at the draft, got to meet him briefly. He is uh, maybe the quintessential guy to be able to cover the draft because um, he is very much an elbow bumper hobnob where he was talking to everybody every night well into the evening whenever I saw him, it was late and he was still go, go, going. And then he was out and about early the next morning. I don't know how he survives. Maybe he's not a real person, but that is a investigational podcast for another day. He is very good at his job, robot or human. Um, and he says in his report from, uh, I don't know, was it this past weekend, JT early this week? I, I can't so. remember. Yeah. Early, early on this week, he reported post combine, uh, uh, surveying, he, he talked to a number of GMs. He claimed his sources were all active GMs in the league right now. So, you know, the guys that ran Carth and the Titans would be calling to shop Derrick Henry. And he said he heard multiple teams saying that the Titans were, in fact, shopping Derrick Henry. And he appears to be on the trade block. We then heard, I believe it was a CBS Jonathan Jones report. Pardon me if that's incorrect. I think it was a CBS report the next day saying, oh, we've got we, we've got intel that says he's not being shopped. Um, And I think the semantics at play here, I think both are reliable reports when you read into both of them, which I recommend you do. They both seem reliable. They both seem to be coming from from folks telling the truth or at least telling their the version of what they were told by their sources. Right. And I think ultimately what's going on here is both reports are right. I just think it's a matter of wordplay here. 
Silver was very particular in the way that he described Henry being shopped. He didn't choose that word lightly. I think that he means it's being tossed around in conversation. Maybe it's not they're actually ironing out the numbers. Maybe it's not it's a phone call from their desks and in their offices at the team facilities. Maybe it was a discussion that happened over a drink at 2 a.m. at Prime 47 in, Indi- in, in, in Indianapolis. Like, shopping a guy could mean a lot of things. Now, when a, a guy with CBS or whoever goes and asks these teams after the report from Silver comes out that he's being shopped, hey, has have you heard Derrick Henry being shopped by the Titans? Hey, Titans, have y'all been shopping Derrick Henry? Their answer could very easily be no, no, shopping, no, because in their eyes, maybe they think we're not actively trying to get rid of him, but that doesn't mean we weren't bringing him up in conversation. So I think it may be some word play going on here that that may be the 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 root of the conflicting reports. They may both be saying the the same thing. They may, may they may both be true. Um, but but ultimately, I, I think. I, I don't I don't think he's going to go anywhere right now. If I'm if I'm having to put a number on it as of today, 823 p.m. on Thursday, March the 9th, I'd say there is a 95 percent chance he's still here. And really, that has less to do with the Titans desire or lack thereof to shop him and get rid of him and a lot more to do with. I don't know who's trading for him. I, I just don't know who's trying to pick up a 10 million dollar contract for a guy, especially in this year uh, with a number of viable running back free agents available a a really really great class of rookie running backs coming up like there are options out there and when i put myself in the shoes of these other gms you know the bills or the chiefs or the maybe the Bengals of joe mixon still in trouble or like one of these teams that could afford a luxury pick in derrick henry maybe the eagles like i just don't see it happening i don't see them making that move and i don't see the titans accepting whatever move anybody would be willing to make i mean who's giving the titans more than a fifth round pick, sixth round pick, like the, these ideas of okay, we'll trade Derek for a second. Ugh, hold, pump the brakes, man. It's not happening. No one, no one's trading a second or a third round pick for Derrick Henry. If they are, it's hilarious because they're morons. So I, I don't think that he's going to go anywhere. But I saw a good point from somebody who I, I wish I'd written it down so I could attribute credit on Twitter. He was talking about this the other day. We're constantly seeing folks crying about. I just oh, I wish the Titans would get a, an offensive coordinator with some fresh ideas who lived in the modern era. I wish they would get away from the ground and pound. Well, come on, do get with the times. I want to see some dramatic offensive change. Change your philosophy, Titans. Change your philosophy, Vrabel. Don't go hiring guys like Tim Kelly who are going to be in that same mold. And that's that's the constant cry, the groaning from fans, especially during the season when things aren't going their way. And yet. We then get to Derrick Henry, you know, the guy who kind of defines the Titans and their ground and pound game. And, oh, the Titans are going to hand it off at least 25 times a game, even if they're losing because they have Derrick Henry. And that's the way that it works. It's the way you have to use him, or at least the way that people think you have to use him. The second that he's on the trading block, all of a sudden the pitchforks come out. We're, we're crying over losing Derrick Henry. You can't. Whoa, hey, you can't get rid of Derrick Henry. What are you doing? This is, he's, he's a Titan. OK. I want crazy change, but I don't want I don't want you to get rid of the guy that defines the thing I'm trying to change. Really? I really I don't think you can have it both ways, man. I, I, I don't I think you can to an extent if your argument is like mine in the sense that, hey, guess what? You can keep Derrick Henry on your team and like Adrian Peterson as his career dwindled, but he stayed around and stayed relevant for years after his prime. You just don't he doesn't command the workload that he previously got. He doesn't he doesn't operate in the same way that you previously operated him in like it, it change You can you can become a different team and still employ Derrick Henry. Now it becomes a question of, OK, well, if we're employing Derrick Henry to run the ball 15 times a game, and we're paying him 10 million dollars. Eh, maybe it's not worth it then financially. Different argument. I understand. But that's the contract you have him signed to. And he's still physically capable of being a, a, a real impact to in, in, in a football game in the NFL. I mean, we saw last year a number of games. He was the only impact in the game. So he still got it. He's still able to carry this team in a, in a, a sense when they need him to. But I just think it's a little bit hypocritical from some folks saying, I wish this team would air it out way more, throw the ball 60 times a game. And also the guy on your team who dictates you run the ball at least 25 times a game, suddenly he's on the chopping block. These guys, we don't know, maybe Tim Kelly and Rand Carthen and Mike Vrabel are considering a big change in philosophy. And that starts with, well, we got to get Derek out of here so we can start over, right? We got to. If I'm if I'm 
Am I, if I'm modifying this uh, this this beaten down house in a residential area to be the the latest brunch spot for people to come and take pictures out on on Saturdays at 8 a.m. and spend way too much money on a crepe, I I've got to remove the the bed and some of the walls. Like you can't I can't keep the you know the queen bed in the in the master living room on the first floor. That's where the kitchen's got to go, man. Like you can't if you're wanting to renovate, you got to tear out the guts that make the place what it used to be, or else it's gonna be what it used to be. So get over it. If you want the Titans to change dramatically, it's probably going to mean you lose some players. And it's definitely going to mean you get some new players that are different from the type of players you've seen in the past. Maybe some smaller receivers, maybe a stable of backs, not a bell cow back. Like those things can change. Now changing topics slightly. I want to say this just to kind of get my take on this out there. Being scared that the Titans are going to lose Derek or give away Derek Henry or cut him or trade him or whatever. And or being upset that they are going to do that sooner than you wish, or maybe just ever. Maybe you realize it's the right thing to do, but it's still sad to you. You're still upset by it. That is perfectly normal and perfectly fair. And those people that are, are saying to you that you shouldn't get attached to players and you're being silly for being scared or upset and to just get over it, they're just as ridiculous and silly as the people who are still crying over the loss of A.J. Brown a year later. Okay, well-adjusted adults can do both. They can be attached to players. I mean, another thing about the NFL, JT, and I don't know if you agree or not, but it's the thing about the NFL that I – it's on my top five list of things that I love the most about this sport that make it different from the other major sports in the U.S. There is still an element of player, team, fan loyalty. It is not the NF, uh, NHL or MLB or, in particular, NBA, where you seemingly just shuffle the deck of star players every offseason, and and you know your team doesn't have you don't have guys in the NBA that are defined by oh Jordan you oh, that's Bulls man you know like uh, you know Kareem oh Lakers yeah of course like you don't have that it's LeBron okay well, when you think LeBron it's Cleveland, Miami, Cleveland, LA, question mark, right? Like it's, it's all over the, when I think KD, I think, uh, Warriors and the Nets and then Suns and oh wait, yeah, he was, with, he was with the Supersonics first, which then became the, the Oklahoma city thunder, like the, all of that. That's what you're not used to seeing in the NFL. It's Peyton Manning. Okay. Broncos at the end, but it's what what do they call the place we were in this week lucas oil stadium it's the house that peyton built he was a cult okay tom brady patriot right joe montana niner uh john elway bronco like it's there these guys ha and it's not just quarterbacks either it's yvonne miller bronco you know delaney walker titan that's that's what the culture of the nfl has been for a long time and yeah they still move and a guy might spend 10 years in his prime at one place and then bounce around to two or three other teams at the end of his career, but it's still that thing, right? And I love that. I, I, I do recognize that the NFL is moving more towards that NBA freestyle shuffle the deck every offseason way of approaching their personnel, and I think to an extent some of that is good. I think that there's a happy medium to be had, but I don't want it to cross so far into uh, we've passed the happy medium was 10 miles that way. Now we're headed into NBA territory. And we're, we, you know, we just, we can't, cause if you're an NBA fan, man, I don't know. You can't possibly get attached to players. There's no way. Cause if you fall in love with a player, he, he could be gone before the season's over. Like, that's just the way that it goes. If you're a, if you're a Celtics fan, that's the closest thing I get, I guess you could get to being a, a loyal fan. But like, I wouldn't get attached to Jason Tatum or, or Marcus Smart or, or Brown because they're, they're all inevitably going to go play somewhere else. That's just the way that it works. Right. Um, and they may even go find they may go win three rings somewhere else. And suddenly their career is defined by that place. Like AJ Brown, his career is going to be defined by his time in in Philadelphia, almost certainly, as long as he sticks around there and continues to have success, even though he was a great Titan. Like that's where we're headed. So I think it's silly for you not to get attached to players in the NFL. I think holding on to that vestige of of tradition and culture that the NFL provides that's different from other prevailing sports in the US is important. It is reasonable, and you should be able to, as a well-adjusted adult, be upset when players you're attached to leave, but also, you know, realize that's business, and you get over it, and uh, you, you pout for a couple of days, and then you've moved on. doesn't mean you can't be attached in the first place. Our final question today, we sort of had the three big dominoes of the 2023 offseason. By the way, the moron that wrote this said three, he meant four. Let's pretend four. he meant four. Okay. This guy's an idiot. So, like, three and it. a half. So sure. three and a half fall in the 2023 right, yeah. uh, 
offseason, including the game of quarterback musical chairs with right. Lamar getting the non-exclusive franchise tag, Derek Carr, Daniel Jones, and Geno Smith all getting their long-term deals done. What does this mean for the rest of the QB market? And how about ranking these QB situations for the Giants, Ravens, Seahawks, and Saints? All right, so this is the last question we have before we get out of here. So real quick before I answer that, I'm going to give my last sale that I need to check off for today, legally obligated to mention this. And then when I answer this question, we can then go ahead and get on out of here. So we've gone a little bit longer than expected. If you are not subscribed to the show, please go and do that. Wherever you get your podcast, wherever you get the good podcasts, okay, you can get this show. All the good podcast platforms, they've got this one. So subscribe. If you're listening and not subscribed, not sure why, maybe you found us on YouTube, in which case we'll give the old reverse sell. We've got a podcast version of the show too. Go check that out and subscribe there for whenever you can't watch. Maybe you're in the car or the shower. You just want to listen. Boom, podcast version. Flip back and forth, baby. Listen to both. Get both experiences. Um, but if you're subscribed, you then need to go on Apple or uh, Apple iTunes or Spotify, scroll to the bottom of the podcast feed like you're picking an episode. You'll find five stars there. Click the furthest one to the right. It'll give you five gold stars. That gives us a review and uh, a rating. You can leave the review written out, whatever you want to say underneath that. Leave us a five-star rating. We'll read your review, whatever it may be, goofy, silly, shouting yourself out to try to get all of our hundreds of listeners to follow you. Please do it. We'll follow you back. Um, we, we just we want those reviews. It's very helpful to us, the algorithm, all those things, being able to sell the show. I promise it takes you 10 seconds, and it means way more than – your 10 seconds are worth to you, to us, to have those reviews. So I consider it a personal favor. Please stop what you're doing. I know every show you've ever listened to has asked you to do this. Go and do this one for us this one time. Really appreciate it. And can't wait to read all of those awesome reviews on the show when they come through the wire to us. All right, last question here. You asked it. we got a lot of dominoes falling. What are my thoughts? Let me make some sense of it. So we've got, we've got the franchise tag set. Let's start with that real quick, JT. The deadline to... Uh, attribute franchise tags to players came and went this past week and we got six tags given out the commanders this one's kind of the uh if you ever seen the meme with like the the military guys lined up behind the wall and there's the clown with them it's like the one one of these things doesn't belong it's the commanders it's the defensive lineman duran Payne tag i kind of feel like the commanders just felt like we have a tag what should we use it on uh that one that guy Payne's a good player but uh, worth the tag number that they're giving him Anyways, the Cowboys tagged running back Tony Pollard. The Raiders tagged running back Josh Jacobs. The Jaguars tagged tight end Evan Ingram. The Ravens gave the non-exclusive non -exclusive tag to, to Lamar Jackson. And the Giants gave the running back uh, Saquon Barkley, uh, the tag to running back Saquon Barkley. All of these were exclusive franchise tag numbers, uh, tenders given to these players, except for Lamar Jackson. He got the non-exclusive, the very quick crash course on this. I'm not going to go into too much detail. So if you really have no idea what this is, go look it up. But basically speaking, it's a lower number than the exclusive franchise tag would be. The Ravens are signing up to pay him 30 some odd million dollars this year on the non-exclusive tag. But what that allows Lamar Jackson to do is it does not shield him from hitting free, ag free agency like the exclusive tag does. What it does is opens up a closed negotiation period where the player is guaranteed to play for that team at that franchise tag number that season, unless in the next couple of weeks they manage to iron out a long-term deal, in which case they can take that, that sheet, that tender sheet from the franchise tag, crumple it up and throw it out the window. With the non-exclusive franchise tag, same deal, but instead of just being able to negotiate with their team, in the negotiation window, it's an open negotiation window in which the player with the non-exclusive franchise tag designation can go and negotiate potential contracts with any team in the league. And what happens is if they go, for example, when Lamar Jackson comes to Rand Carthon and the Titans, they iron out a four year, $200 million deal, 50 million APY. I am not, I'm not reporting this. I'm making this up. That is a situation where they would then send that tender to the Ravens and say, hey, we're going to sign your guy. This is the number. This is the contract. He signed it. You know, you now have, and I think it's like a five-day window or something like that, to match this or else you lose your guy. And in return, the Titans would then be forced to send their, 20, their own 2023 and 2024 first-round picks to the Ravens in return. So the Ravens would essentially be losing their guy in free agency but getting a mandatory two future firsts 
from the team that's signing them away. They also have the option, if the Titans send them that tender, to say, okay, cool, we like this number two. We're going to take this tender, scribble out the Titans name at the top, put our name on it, and now we're signing you, Lamar Jackson. We're matching this offer. You're going to play on our team, and we're going to give you this deal that the Titans offered you. And then there's a back and forth kind of thing that can happen. But that's what happens. And the reason why the Ravens chose to do it this way instead of giving him the exclusive tag is because they are making the gamble that essentially they think nobody out there is willing to give Lamar and his agent. And by agent, I mean Lamar because he has no agent. Nobody's willing to meet with Lamar and give him a, a number in the ballpark of what he's wanting. This crazy Deshaun Watson fully guaranteed break the bank 200 million plus dollar deal that he's wanting to match and and set the market rate with and and really reshape the way that a plus elite quarterback contracts are done in the future. That's what he's attempting to do. He's he's attempting to kind of champion of the people this thing and become a champion of the players in the sense that for years the number one thing players have asked for is fully guaranteed contracts like they have in every other major sport in, in the U.S., by the way. The difference is in the NFL, you can't guarantee money to these guys because they get hurt so often, and sometimes you just, like, you can't fully guarantee. Like, in the NBA, if Kevin Durant tears his ACL and misses a full season where he's owed $55 million, he's getting those $55 million. In the NFL, it's not the way that it works. There are all these clauses of, well, you got to play a certain number of games, you get this amount per game, blah, 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 blah. What he's doing here is a direct assault on the owners and the way that they like to operate in not going fully guaranteed. And they don't like that. And so there is absolutely some collusion going on here because I don't know, he's, he's not already, he's already got like five or six teams that you would think would be interested in him immediately, not interested in him, which is ridiculous. I mean, these are NFL teams spend countless hours doing their due diligence Regarding every player, every position, they turn over every rock, they look in every nook and cranny, and now a former league MVP is available to be had, and they just all say the day of, we're good. We're good. We're fine. No, I, we'll pass. Pass. Thank you, though. Right. Right. It reeks, right? It's, it's of course, it's open collusion. Um, but they, they're going to get, get away with it because it's their league. Um, and I think that the confusion surrounding, wait a second, 10 seconds ago, we had Deshaun Watson bidding war between many of these teams, like the Falcons, for example, were willing to risk it all and go all in on the sexual predator Deshaun Watson. And then 10 seconds later, Lamar Jackson is available, definitely a better quarterback right now than Deshaun Watson. And they immediately say, we're good, man. We'll pass. We're not interested. It's confusing. It's frustrating. But if we understand those two things as a reaction to the other and not independent things that don't don't seem to make sense uh in in the same context it makes more sense the nfl ownership was furious furious with the browns ownership in their decision to give all that guaranteed money to deshaun watson last year they're not interested in doing that there are outdated rules with escrow where you have to put guaranteed money away in a bank somewhere it's complicated. We don't have time to get into it today. We'll probably talk about it in a future episode. It needs to be done away with, but it's the, the crutch that NFL teams lean on in order to not give these fully guaranteed deals. The Falcons, for example, they draft a tight end fourth overall two seasons ago. They draft a wide receiver eighth overall last year. They then proceed to slap on leather helmets and run the ball. Like it's the silent film era. Like they don't know, they don't know what they're doing. Uh, I, I think is the one way to look at it. Why were they in on Deshaun Watson and now out on Lamar? You can, I think, alternatively look at it as they're trying to fit in with the status quo, play nice in the NFL community. They don't want to, to, to be the team that, because once you have two fully guaranteed contracts in the $250 million range for quarterbacks, Having one is an outlier. Having two is a pattern, and that sets a precedent for the future and more players to ask for that kind of money. So it's a mess. It's collusion. It's going to be interesting to see how it all turns out. I think ultimately Lamar's headed back to, to Baltimore probably for that money. But listen, he'll get $30 million guaranteed this year, and then if they do it again next year, it'll be like $42 million because it is 120% of what the previous year's money was if you tag him again. So big deal for him. Real quick, final thing on the franchise tags. I do think the biggest thing about the franchise tag market this year is that it changes the way that we have to look at this year's free agent market for the running backs. 
the 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 tags were given out to the three best running backs that were set to hit free agency this year. The the, the tag being put on Tony Pollard, Josh Jacobs, and Saquon Barkley, taking them off the list kind of throws the rest of the market into whack because here's the list sort of ranked in terms of free agent running backs available this year. Miles Sanders, David Montgomery, Jeff Wilson Jr., Devin Singletary, Damian Harris, Kareem Hunt, Jamal Williams, Raheem Mostert, Rashad Penny, Jarek McKinnon, and Alexander Madison. Little lackluster when you don't have Pollard, Jacobs, and Barkley heading up that list. And if now the top guy on that list decides that, well, I'm at the front of the line now, so give me that running back one money. Let's go, 15, 15 million APY. I just don't think teams are going to look at that and be like, Miles Sanders for $13 million a year or, and hear me out, we're staring directly down the barrel of a running back class in which there are going to be like six or seven guys on day two or three that make GMs across the league look very, very smart um, because it's going to be very much like the Chiefs last year getting a seventh rounder who's a pivotal in their playoff run. Uh, and they're paying, you know, Isaiah Pacheco 10 cents a game. Like that's what teams would much rather do than giving $13 million a year to a, a, a guy like Miles Sanders to come in and probably not be worth even half of that money. So I think that that's an interesting one for the Jets part. And let's not forget about the, the New York football Jets. They are in scary hours, man. It is now Aaron Rodgers or nothing for them. They've lost out on the Derek Carr sweepstakes. Um, they are still all in on their number one choice. So it's it's almost like they're playing deal or no deal. And that five hundred thousand dollar tile is blacked out, which is a bummer that now it's down to they've got, you know, a $400 tile and a million dollar tile. And they are just praying to the good Lord above. Please. Can my case be the million dollar case? We're going to fly the entire brain trust out to green Bay so that we can try to schmooze him and, and talk him up and get him to come out here. Because if we don't get this million dollar case, if we don't get Aaron Rodgers, man, people are going to be really mad. It's going to be bad. It's going to be okay. Jimmy G Ryan Tannehill. I do think in terms of the Titans sake uh, of this, of this discussion, they're part of this discussion. It makes things interesting if they lose out on Carr and they lose out on Rodgers. Oh boy, JT, that our 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 percentage pie of outcomes for the Titans quarterbacks next season suddenly gets very interesting, very interesting. Um, and I think that that changes kind of the entire scope of what the Titans offseason looks like. We're not going to cross that bridge prematurely. I do think JT right now doesn't it feel like. Rodgers is more likely than not heading to the Jets because like the Jets who feel like they have no options besides Rodgers kind of feels like Rodgers has no options besides the Jets. It doesn't sound like Green Bay wants him back. I mean, the yeah, the biggest thing I heard all last week was the Packers are pretty much done with Rodgers. They hope he doesn't we, come back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah so I, I think that they are meant for each other in the sense that there's nobody else for either of them. So if that works out, then cool, good for the Jets. Have fun paying $60 million to Mr. Ayahuasca. Um, I, I, I do think that it is interesting. Um, the, the only other team that really made some sense maybe was the Raiders. And we saw a report from Dov Kleinman this past week saying update Packers QB Aaron Rodgers is quote, very unlikely to join the Raiders per Peter King, who knows a thing or two. There are a lot of people around the NFL that think that Mark Davis, the owner of the Raiders does not want or can't. This is the running joke drink. Every time somebody in NFL media makes fun during the offseason of Mark Davis being the poorest owner in the league. It happens. You can set your clock. You set your watch to it. Um, it. It's rumored that he can't or won't throw the $60 million necessary to fulfill Rogers contract. So King uh, adds that no one but the Jets is, quote, chasing after end quote Rogers. Sounds about right. As for the four teams that do have quarterback deals either done or on the table in the case of the Ravens, the Seahawks, Giants, Saints and Ravens. Part of the question from our dear reader was, can you rank their quarterback situations? I will. I think that's the order. I think it's from best to worst right now. Seahawks, Giants, Saints, and Ravens. And I'll brief, I've already touched on the Ravens, but the first three I'll briefly touch on and then get out of here. For the Seahawks part, Geno Smith, they got him on a really, really convenient contract, three years, $105 million. When you break that down, they're essentially paying him like 20 or $25 million a year for three years, two or three years. I think there's an out after two years. He did right by the city. Um, he's, he's a guy that is a, a feel good guy in the league, like seems to be the kind of guy that fans really would love. Um, I, I think that they are in great shape with a guy who had an awesome year, seeing if he can prove it and do it again. And they got him at an awesome number. I mean, we thought when the Titans gave Ryan Tannehill his new contract in a very similar situation with the comeback player of the year hype, 
the, it felt like, well, they got him at a nice number. No, man, the Seahawks got hit Geno Smith at a nice, nice number. I think that brings him in below the 16 mark in terms of quarterbacks, APY salaries, and it'll continue to fall down the ranks as some of these quarterbacks this offseason get contracts. With the Giants, I do think that they overpaid a little bit for Danny Dimes, but they really didn't have any better options available to them, so I understand why they did it. I do think their decision to not franchise tag him was clouded a little bit by the fact that they wanted to use that tag on Saquon Barkley and keep both in the building. One could argue that maybe you should have let Saquon test the market and give give your your guy who had his first somewhat good year in Danny Dimes that franchise tag so you're not on the hook. They do end up giving him a big contract. I think they're spending – JT, I don't have this one in front of me. If you wouldn't mind looking this one up. I think they're spending – in the 30 to 35 million per year range on on um on Danny Dimes but but nonetheless when you look into the details of that contract you you see that while it's a let's see do you have the actual terms pulled up JT? <clears throat> yeah so for 2024 uh it's going to be 35 2025 is 30 and then okay. 2026 they backload it to 46 kind of like a DAC situation do you have the full terms on there like the years and full contract yeah, basically. Is it four, is it was it four or five year? Uh, four year. Four year, hundred and sixty. Yes. Okay, that's what I thought. So four one sixty. Again, people initially thought, oh my gosh, forty million a year. No, it's more like thirty thirty five a year, uh, with some incentives in there. I believe they have an out after year two. So they essentially signed him to an overpaid contract, but they got a really nice warranty. Like they they got the Apple Care. You know, like they got they they put a nice warranty on him because there's a lot of outs where if he sucks, they can get out and not be too on the hook real bad in terms of money owed or um, dead cap. So it's a fine move. I think it was a necessary move. Third team is the Saints. They continue to be the most wild card, unhinged front office in the league. I don't know where they continue to get their money from. They, As an organization, clearly their front office, Mickey Loomis and the guys down in New Orleans, they are much more interested in always competing than they are in contending for rings which there's some value to i mean it's some casual fans being able to win eight nine ten twelve games a year and then win a playoff game or two and then just call it call it a year every year like the saints have done a little bit like the packers have done for a long time like the titans have done for a a couple of the past five years for the most part like there's value to that and and you know your, your fan base enjoys that you can make a lot of money doing that but more diehard fans and people in the media would argue hey you're not ever gonna win a ring doing that and uh the saints it seems are not interested in they don't they say okay cool we don't care we will take one Derek Carr please and so they did four years 150 million dollars fine contract um it it is it is a situation though where I just don't I mean they they're in good position right now to win that division I wouldn't be shocked if a better quarterback comes in for one of those teams because the other three teams essentially don't have a quarterback right now um but right now they seem to be in a good position to win their division. And like I've always said, if you win your division, you've got a shot. So maybe that's their thinking. Good luck with that. And uh, with that, I think we'll call it a day here. Goodness. So much. I'm not sure there's ever been a show with more information packed in to 123 minutes, but, or excuse me, uh, an hour and 23 minutes. Clearly my brain is fried. JT, I know you got darts to go throw. I've got some things to attend to before a bachelor party. I'm going on this weekend. So wish me luck. I get out of the, I get out of the, I get out of the uh, party scene fire uh in indianapolis i get thrown right back into the the kettle this weekend so wish me luck on that but we will be back next week regular schedule shows monday wednesday and friday for monday's part there's a chance we have it out first thing in the morning as usual there's a chance we have it out in the afternoon i can guarantee you jt we're holding ourselves to this our our listeners we promise you there will be a show monday wednesday friday next week barring i don't know trading ryan Tannehill. then you know everything's up in the air who knows um until then have a great weekend i'm your host easton freeze this has been the hot read podcast for producer jt we'll talk to you next weekend have a great one Uh